I don't care how you slice it, that's wrong. We have more black men in prison today than we had in slavery in 1863. That's wrong. During my incarceration, I, I missed my daughter's first Christmas, her first New Year's, her first Thanksgiving. It, it shattered me. That was one of the most crucial moments of my life. But during the tough on crime era, the emphasis on incarceration was really that it was retributive. It was meant to punish. It was meant to keep people away from community. The elders, like my mother and aunts, really felt the hit that um, I or any other family member who was doing prison time wasn't there for family gatherings, things like that. We know how hard it is for people to um, obtain jobs, but without a diploma, that just puts you further and further back. I went from a level two to a level three, from a level three to a level four. And with that being said, my the programs were limited for me. There was a time where I couldn't even go to school. There's a real danger of returning to an unnecessary and bloated carceral state that costs money, that destroys lives, that undermines families. Because this system that we have didn't just pop up. It was built. We built it brick by brick. And you'll see that in 2002, when we first were talking to Connecticut, you were one of the fastest growing prison populations in the country. When we looked at 2010 to 2012, you can see that you are the state with one of the uh, fastest declining prison populations in the country. You can set an example by doing, and that will become a motivation for people to have some hope that somebody cares somewhere. We're incarcerating people in this country out of habit. It's a bad habit, we need to break that. Can you introduce yourself and tell me a bit about your experience within the criminal justice system? I'm a professor of human rights. I've visited and documented conditions in over 200 detention centers, prisons, jails throughout the hemisphere and have worked to try and reduce incarceration and, and minimize the abuses that occur within closed correctional facilities. What is the current state of affairs regarding incarceration in Connecticut and the Northeast more broadly? The number of folks held in prisons, in detention centers, in jails in Connecticut has fallen by 25% over the past year. And that continues a trend of decarceration. That represents a real opportunity to rethink the carceral state. We need to take this opportunity seize it, and continue the move in the right direction. I'm Miriam Gohara, and I'm Clinical Associate Professor of Law at Yale Law School. What we find time and again is that our clients have been victims or survivors of very serious harm well before they ever, ever hurt anybody else. And that harm comes in many forms. It comes in the form of abject poverty, it comes in the form of educational neglect, it comes in the form of households that are not equipped to provide the kinds of supports, family supports that we know that every child needs to succeed. It comes in the form of exposure to violence in their neighborhoods, even when they have very loving homes. What we're saying is leniency or moderation or proportionality of punishment is actually very deserved and very morally necessary in order to account for all of the harms that our communities neglect and divestment in certain communities has brought by way of bundling those survivors into the criminal legal system. What does human rights law have to say about criminal justice in the US? We cannot have a mass incarceration state. It is not consistent with human rights standards. So two ideas, prison has to be an absolutely last resort, one, and two, 
prisons and detention centers have to be humane and they must focus on education, job training, and reentry. I believe that we can get there. And I believe that the most tangible way right now, what we can do right now, is support initiatives of education. And Walter talking about education, and you tell me a budget that anybody put forward in which the prisons are funded, I'll show you who's been shortchanged. And it's always education. Investment in education and job training correlates directly to reduce recidivism and safety. There are all sorts of places I think that we could be investing in community that would make a massive difference. Job programs, um, some of our reentry services in the state of Connecticut are, are so strong. Some of the grassroots groups that are doing this work are so good. And if we could provide them with more resources to scale up even further. And I was thrilled to see that Governor Lamont has committed to closing several prisons in the state. And it would be so welcome for the, some of that those millions of dollars that the state will save from those closures to invest in the types of things that I just described. What role should directly affected communities play in advocacy and reform? It's incredibly important that we have people who are experiencing the systems in the local communities in which they're playing out be the spokespeople for what's happening. Participation and community engagement are central. It's part of why we think this uh, gathering is so essential from a human rights perspective, but also for the Connecticut General Assembly. Admittedly, there's more room, there's much improvement that can occur, but Connecticut is a leader and there, I have no doubt that that leadership is a result of the committed action of grassroots and social justice groups in the state over the past few decades. This system that we have didn't just pop up. It was built. We built it brick by brick. And in the process of taking it down, it has to be taken down brick by brick.